Hello again and welcome to another Warhammer 40k Morty and Glory video. In today's episode, we are going to be taking a look at the Officer of the Fleet, a little known Imperial Guard character, but one which has the potential to break Arcs of Omen and in the right circumstances, win Guard players their game in a single turn. And now that I have your attention with this rather bold claim, let the fleet do the flying, the MI do the dying, and we're going to crack on with today's video. So the first thing that I'm sure many of you are asking is, what the heck is an officer of the fleet? You may have used stronger language than that, but I am trying to avoid getting demonetized. In the fluff, these officers are meant to act as liaisons between the Imperial Guard ground forces and the Imperial Navy stationed in orbit. Whilst there is an inherent animosity and rivalry between the ground pounders and the flyboys, most Imperial Guard commanders can look past this and are professional enough to recognise that officers of the fleet are an incredibly valuable asset. They bring to the table an extensive knowledge of many aircraft, be they friend or foe, and they can also be relied upon to call in airstrikes to support the advancing infantry. In a really tight situation, an officer of the fleet may even help a guard commander call in an orbital bombardment against a particularly strong fortification or to try and delay the advance of an enemy breakthrough. Now that is the fluff. But I know what you guys are like. You degenerate, win at all costs, competitive players. You're not interested in the fluff. You want to know how these guys work in the crunch. How do they perform on the tabletop? What is this thing that could potentially break the game? Well, on the surface, they don't seem all that exciting or powerful. Firstly, they are a regimental attache. That means whilst they are a character that you can find in the HQ section of the book, they do not take up an HQ slot in your force organization chart. And in fact, they must always be attached to a command squad at the beginning of the game. Essentially, you should see them as an upgrade to your command squads, one which allows you to add an extra model to the unit that comes with some unique abilities. Now, officers of the fleet cost 25 points, but they only have the same basic stat line as a guardsman. That's right, they're only movement 6, weapon skill 4+, plus, ballistic skill 4+, plus, strength 3, toughness 3, wounds 1, attacks 1, leech 7, 5 plus 8. They're just essentially a 25-point guardsman. And if you were to look at their data sheet, the only ability these guys have is Aeronautica Commander, which is a way of giving reroll ones to hit to your flyers. And this has traditionally been the reason why people have included officers of the fleet in their army. They've been taking multiple flyers, they want to be able to give them some kind of reroll ones to hit because they can't get it via tank orders or anything else. And so you include an officer of the fleet so that your flyers can perform better on the tabletop. That is the traditional way they've been run. That is not the way we're going to be looking at them today. You see, what makes the officer of the fleet so good is not his stat line or his equipment or his ability, but it is the unique stratagem that he has access to. Orbital interference is a two command point stratagem. And how it works is you use the stratagem at the start of the reinforcement step of your opponent's movement phase if an officer of the fleet model from your army is on the battlefield. If it is the first or second battle round, you can select one of your opponent's strategic reserve or reinforcement units. That unit cannot arrive on the battlefield this phase for any reason, even if it has another rule that states it always arrives on the battlefield during a specific battle round, e.g. drop pod assault. You can only use this stratagem once. Now, sadly, we can't use this stratagem on turn three. That would be incredibly powerful because if you could trap an enemy unit in reserve on turn three, then it would get automatically destroyed because any units that are not brought in from reserve on turn three going into turn four are automatically just wiped out. They just can't come in for the rest of the game. But despite GW not letting us be completely toxic, the Officer of the Fleet stratagem is still incredibly powerful. As we're going to see in just a moment, it has the ability to completely mess with your opponent's head and disrupt their carefully laid game plan. So how has the Officer of the Fleet come to the fore with Arcs of Omen and how does he potentially break the game? Well, it all comes down to the fact that players can put units in reserve for zero command points. 
Previously, you had to pay command points depending on how much power level you were going to put into Strategic Reserve, and this meant that a lot of players never bothered with it. I mean, over the course of 9th edition, Games Workshop has been increasingly stingy with command points, and so a lot of armies out there which were getting increasingly more elite focused, and including less troops and less chaff, were finding themselves with very large elite death ball kind of units that if they wanted to put them in reserve was going to take up their remaining command points. But the risk of starting your Death Star on the battlefield meant that if your opponent got the first turn, turn even if you did have some kind of redeploy there were those armies out there that would be able to get the drop on your death star and do some serious damage to it before you'd be able to buff it up in your command or your psychic phase or any other phase that you might be able to really start supercharging this unit that is very powerful and now there has always been those units that can go in reserve or deep strike for free of course of course but what is so important about arcs of omen making it free cost you no command points to put in reserve is that many opponents are just going to do it instinctively without thinking i mean it's free real estate right and on paper it is a great way to help avoid your best unit getting pounded by the guard firepower turn one no one wants to be hit by loads of mortars with take aim or the field ordnance batteries that may be being boosted by creed and getting extra strength and extra ap no one wants their best unit getting absolutely pounded by by the guard guns before they've had a chance to really get it up and running but if your opponent does put a large part of his army in reserve be it lots of medium strength units or a big death star unit then that is a complete trap when you have got an officer of the fleet in your army and this is because it could potentially mean that your opponent is having to fight without a key part of his army for three of your turns I mean, think about it. If you get the first turn, then you get turn one to start doing damage to your opponent and moving into position. Your opponent gets his turn one. He might not want to overly commit because he's waiting for his reserves to come in. Great, fine, no problem. Then it comes over to your turn two and you continue to move into position. You continue killing what units you can, having a great time. It then goes over to your opponent's turn two, and he thinks, right, now my reserves are going to come in. Now it's time for me to start doing the damage. And he comes out at you. He comes into engagement range. He wants to start having a big old fight with the guard, be it a shooting fight or a combat fight. Then he does his movement, and then it gets to the end of the movement phase where he comes to bring his reinforcements in. And he tries to bring in that key unit. And you go, sorry, two command points, your unit can't come in till next turn. Suddenly your opponent has gone all in, but he's exposed, and then he has to survive a third guard shooting phase without a part of his army, potentially an incredibly significant part of his army, on the battlefield. And then by the time the reserves do come in turn three, it's already too late. Too much damage has been done to a core part of the opponent's force. And no matter how powerful these reinforcements are, they are now going to have to be taking on the majority of your army. I mean, just think about it for a second. Imagine if your opponent has a big demon. We've got World Eaters around the corner. Chaos Demons are very popular. Imagine your opponent has a big demon. Or also a Tau Crisis Suit Death Ball. We know that Crisis Suits are really meta, but we know we're entering into a shooting meta. People dropping in, clearing entire drop zones. That's what the meta is going towards. Or you've got a Super Heavy. Super Heavies really struggle to stay alive on many 40k boards because they can't hide out of line of sight. Putting them in reserve and bringing them in turn two would be a great way of protecting them and allowing you to get your drop on the opponent with these very powerful units. But if you assume that your opponent has spent about 500 points on one of these units and he puts it in reserve and he can't bring it into the battle until his turn three that could mean that your opponent has to face 2000 points of guard shooting with only 1500 points of his own army but it doesn't even need to be something as so dramatic as a big demon or a super heavy it could be something as straightforward as a unit of stern guard veterans in a drop pod
Marine infantry in general is looking very meta right now, but one of the problems that Marine players are going to face is getting those slow walking infantry up the battlefield. Now, you could put them into strategic reserve and have them outflank, great, or you could put them in drop pods, have them come down, great. Either way, you're going to want to be putting some of these guys in reserve so that you can get them up the battlefield safely. Or you could be looking at something like some Terminators. Perhaps you've got a 10 man squad of Deathwing that you want to drop in onto a central objective and just be like, look, this point is mine and you ain't taking it off me without a serious fight but if you have an officer of the fleet in your army you're gonna really mess up your opponent's plans and put them in a really tricky situation look you may have explained to your opponent that look i've got this officer of the fleet in my army it can disrupt reserves is what it can do and they may have absorbed that information they may have not they may be aware of it they may have forgotten about it sometimes until you've actually experienced something it is hard to appreciate what it's going to do and the impact it's going to have. But let's say your opponent is a Marine player and he's like, okay, I've got these units in reserve, in drop pods. Uh, I've got this big unit of Terminators. Um, I'm going to bring them in turn one or turn two. And I'm going to essentially, in whatever movement phase I decide to act, I'm going to go all in. I've got to overwhelm these guard in one big blow and cause them to not be able to fight back effectively. Well, because this happens in your reinforcement step, your opponent is going to go, okay, expose on my army, Get it ready for the fight. Don't worry, lads. The 10 Deathwing are coming. We're going to be okay. Don't worry. The Stern Guards are coming in. It's going to be okay. And then they don't arrive. And suddenly, this firepower that your opponent was relying upon, or was at least expecting to seal the deal, doesn't arrive. And suddenly, he has got into a firefight, and he's not got all of the tools available to him. And so he's going to do less damage than expected. If you start pairing this with things like Death Corp Krieg and the Dreadnought and other units that are abnormally tough in your guard army, your opponent is going to go in there and just do way less damage than he expected to do. And then you are going to be able to exploit that because he's gone all in. He's put his foot on the line. He's ready to go. And no one wants to get into an, un an unrequited firefight with the Gab. And then when his reinforcements do come in, it's like, well, they're too little too late. Those 10 Terminators dropping in are great coming in turn three. But now that most of the other army has been destroyed, they're really not going to be as durable as they should be because they're going to have to take the brunt of the firepower. Whereas before they were relying on other parts of the army to draw away firepower and distract. 10 Deathwing Terminators are incredibly potent, but they're not going to stand up to close on 2,000 points of guard firepower. No way, Jose. Now, the other scenario is that your opponent is aware of the officer of the fleet and they decide, you know what, I'm not going to put anything in reserve. I'm going to just start it all on the battlefield because then at least I've got control of it from the start of the game. I don't know if my opponent was going to stop me turn one or turn two or now. Ha! Look, now he doesn't get to stop me at all. What a stupid bastard. He's not. He's got a 25-point model in his army and it's not doing anything. Ha ha ha! Yes, somehow that means I win. But they've not won because you, with a single 25-point model, have forced them to completely alter their game plan. Probably into a less favorable, less efficient one than what they had originally. I mean, sure, starting with that great demon on the board is great. Starting with those Terminators on the board is great. Starting with that Super Heavy on the board is great. Now it's going to be able to participate from turn one. But now those Terminators are having to foot slog across the battlefield. That's going to take them a lot longer to get to that middle object. They want to lock down for Oath of Moment or other secondaries or even just primary points. Now that demon with a big uh, wound cap on it is going to be exposed. And you are going to have a Cyan Death Ball that doesn't care about wound caps. And it's going to die as it tries to vainly flap its way across the battlefield. Now that Super Heavy is on the board. And it can't benefit from obscuring terrain. And you're able to draw a line of sight to it with your Vanksha cannons or your Rogal Dawns or other big guns. And so your opponent loses that super heavy. And so either way, you are putting your opponent in a real catch-22. You're putting them in an impossible situation. Because they either need to commit to their plan and stick with the reserves, accept the disruption, at which point you are in control, you are going to be able to uh, pick and choose the best points for when they bring those reserves in. Your opponent is going to have to do a lot of work to be like, okay, I'm probably going to have to come until turn three now. That might mean I need to hold back a few turns. Okay, well, if they do decide to hold back, 
then you're going to be able to start spreading out across the board, playing the, the primary game, getting ahead on points, forcing your opponent to play catch up, which is not something that a lot of armies want to do. Or your opponent does start them on the board, at which point it's game on, it's fight on. I'm going to be able to start uh, pounding you with my guns, even if it's just I'm going to be hitting you with my artillery. I might not be doing a huge amount of damage, but it's more damage than you would have taken if you've been able to start in reserve and come in when you wanted to. So in conclusion, the officer of the fleet themselves are not very important or impressive, but the stratagem that they give access to is really, really good. It can potentially win you the game single-handedly if your opponent goes all in and his expected reinforcements don't turn up, allowing you to win the firefight before he can get a key part of his army into the fight. Or it would completely disrupt your opponent's plans, cause them to have to adapt on the fly, which may lead to them making mistakes. The best bit about the whole thing is that the officer of the fleet only costs 25 points. You can handily chuck him into your army and go to a tournament with him. And even if he's only relevant in one game, it has not been a major setback for those four games that all he really did was act as an extra ablative wound. 25 points is so cheap. It's what a lot of guard players end up spending their last few points on handing out some cool equipment because they can't afford any other units. If you are a guard commander and you're getting to the end of your list, and you're like, oh, I've got like 20, 30 points left over. Over. I'm really not sure. Should I stick a stub on my tanks or whatever? No. Instead, this is where the last 25 points should always go. But I would probably not even think about this as a final afterthought. I would truly, at least for the start of Arcs of Omen, I'll have to see how it plays out, but I would truly think of this guy as just being tacked onto every single list. Use him for a dozen games. See if he becomes useful. See if he really disrupts your opponent's plans. Take him to a tournament. I think you may just find that he is a fantastic 25 point investment. But what do you guys think? Let me know down in the comment section below. Do you think that reserves are going to become really important and very, very common in Arcs of Omen? Or do you think that people will not really take advantage of it and would rather start off with everything on the board? If you've enjoyed today's video, make sure you smash that like button just like your opponent is going to smash their forehead into the table when they realize that they've forgotten what the officer of the fleet can do. And also subscribe to make sure that you never miss an episode. If you've really enjoyed today's video and you want to go the extra mile and see more content like this, then please consider becoming a channel member or Patreon supporter. One of the big perks you get for being a channel member or Patreon is access to the Mordian Glory Discord. This is an online community with almost 900 active members. It's always popping off in the MG Discord. We're always talking about army lists, tactics, strategy, painting, hobbying, and we've even got a very spicy meme section as well. So if that sounds like a ton of fun or a helpful resource, then please become a channel member or Patreon supporter. And I'd just like to take a moment to say a big thank you to to all of the latest channel members. So thank you to Brandon Tran, Evolution of Gaming, Nathan Thomason, Alan Blunt, Trips Clips, Michael Vosberg, and Lee9055. Thank you guys for doing your part. I also want to do a shout out to the latest Patreon supporters as well. So big thank you to Jonish Jollopy, Alan Blunt the Third, Dale Cromwell, Akasha Rekka, Red Morrison, Nate, and Janet Wicks. Now last, but certainly not least, I would like to say a personal thank you to all of my top tier Patreon supporters. These are the War Masters, the people who are truly going above and beyond the Call of Duty and are a big reason of how I am able to do this channel full time now. So a massive thank you to Alan Blunt III, Bon Bon Vert, Phil French, Ross Miller, Sawfish Trombone, Alex Dengal, John Stubbs, Nick Walsh, Diesel Fox, Tom Sutton, and August Varney. Thank you guys for your very generous support. It makes a truly tremendous difference. I hope you all enjoyed today's video. Thank you for watching. And of course, as always, I'll see you guys next time.